So today we're going to look at spectroscopy and radiochemistry. This is the physical sciences material that's always on the MCAT. So we start with the Bohr atom, and it's on the AAMC MCAT contout outline. They specifically say Bohr atom. So we have to think about atoms. People had known they've been around for a long time. But the pre-Bohr atom was, the knowledge was that electrons were negative. J.J. Uh, Thomson had discovered electrons in the 1890s, but they knew atoms were neutral. And so this created a conundrum, and a bunch of models got put forth, but none of which were very satisfying. But then around 1900, Rutherford discovered the nucleus, and he discovered it's a very small and dense aspect of the atom. And then Rydberg figured out that atoms only emit light at certain frequencies. So what Bohr came up with is that electrons have distinct quantized energy levels, and that was consistent with the Planck equation, which is E equals H nu, or E equals HC over lambda. Now, we know that the Planck constant is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per second. You should definitely remember that for the MCAT. Um, this is the frequency, and the speed of light, of course, is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Over here, we see a wave. We know that atoms have particle and wave-like properties to them. So a wavelength is basically the distance between the two maximum points over here. The frequency is a number of waves passing through a point per second. People commonly use the idea of wave number. This is one over the wavelength, and it's designated by the V with the, the uh, line over it. And this is the number of waves in one centimeter. So atomic structure. So we know the Bohr atom basically explained the atom in an analogous manner, the solar system with the planets and the sun. And so a stable atom is defined by its atomic number Z and its mass number A. And here's what it looks like over here. And so we have atomic mass equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. I think we all know that. And then we have to go into unstable atomic structures and look at alpha, beta, and gamma decay. So alpha decay only occurs with heavy nucle uh, nuclei. You have to be N equals greater than 28. Over here, you see uranium-238, a very famous one used uh, in making atomic bombs. And so U-238 is going to decay into U-230, actually it's thorium-234, and then you emit what appears to be helium. And actually alpha decay is basically equivalent to helium. So in alpha decay, what do you do? You lose two protons and two neutrons, which is basically helium. So then in beta decay, what happens is a neutron turns into a proton plus an electron. And so a beta particle is basically an electron. And so for beta decay, what happens if you take a look over here at carbon 14, it actually undergoes beta decay and you have the same atomic number but the number of protons increases and you emit your electron. So gamma irradiation is observed almost exclusively in conjunction with another type of nuclear decay. So here what we see is U-238 undergoing alpha decay in the thorium releasing helium, but the U-234 that's formed, this could be unstable too. And as a consequence, what you emit is a photon and what you see over here, that is gamma radiation emits a photon. There's no change in atomic mass or the atomic number because the photon has neither mass nor charge. So radioactive half-life is something that you should all be familiar with. It's a pretty intuitive concept. There's just a couple things to know. You have to know the formula that T1 half equals 0.693 over lambda. And lambda is a decay constant unique to each unstable nucleus. Here is an actual... Uh, formula, and you see N over NO equals E to the minus T over T to the one half, what you can do is you can substitute T to the one half equals 0.693 over lambda into this equation, and NO is the starting material, and then T is the amount of time that has transpired, and T one half is the half-life itself. So spectroscopy is the interaction of light and matter. Here's a picture of the electron electromagnetic spectrum. I think you've all seen this before, and I think you should kind of commit this to memory. Notice how wavelength and frequency go in opposite directions. Here we see the visible with Roy G. Biv. We have IR, ultraviolet, x-rays, and we'll take a look at some spectros spectroscopy that 
exploits some of the properties of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the first one is infrared or IR spectroscopy. So we got to think of molecules or the bonds in molecules as, as being like molecular springs. That is, they can vibrate, they can go back and forth. And so they're bouncing around a lot. This stretching vibration can be picked up. And in order for this to actually occur, the molecule must have um, a net dipole moment. So a carbon, -like, carbon tetrachloride, for example, which would have no uh, net dipole moment would not be able to give an IR spectrum. So we have stretching vibrations, we have bending over here. And so these, these atoms in the molecule are always moving around and we can pick up on that by putting infrared light into it. And so what people have come up with are these, these spectra here and what you see is basically an IR spectra, we see percent transmittance as a function of the wave number. And what we have is a common IR absorption value table. So for example, what you see over here at around 3,200, you should recognize this as a broad alcohol peak. The alcohol can hydrogen bond in some cases, in other cases it doesn't. It, and that is part of the reason why it's broad. What you see over here um, around 1700 is the classic carbonyl peak right here. Okay, and over around 3000, what you see is the carboxylic acid peak. And so as you go further over here, you get what's known as a fingerprint region. And the AAMC MCAT content outline specifically mentions the fingerprint region. And this region here, it's fingerprint because it's unique to virtually every single compound. And this is a pretty complex spectra here has a lot of bonds like carbon, carbon, things you'd find in virtually all these molecules. So the IR spectra can be used to actually determine the structure of compounds. And we took a really simple one here, ethanol. Okay, here's the IR spectra ethanol. What you have is an OH. Here's the broad peak around 32, 3300. Here's your CH. Here's your CO peak. So what you can do then is you can actually oxidize ethanol into acetaldehyde. And now what you do is you create a carbonyl. Now, although I still have the ethanol specter up here, what you should appreciate is that you would see the disappearance of this peak and the creation of a peak at 1700. So that is the disappearance and the appearance of peaks as a function of reaction progress can be used to monitor the extent in which a reaction has occurred. And what you see if we further oxidize acetaldehyde into acetic acid, what you would do is you would actually generate the carboxylic acid peak here. So we move over to UV or visible spectroscopy, and we know that UV light at a certain wavelength will actually excite electrons, and only two electrons occur in UV visible spectroscopy. What we have is a, a pi to pi stars. This is an anti-bonding molecular orbital. And over here, we have a non-bonding to actual pi star. And so one of the things that's interesting about this is that UV visible only works for molecules that have pi electrons. So over here, we see acetone, a pretty simple molecule here. And what you can see then is that you have a pi to pi star. This is the lambda max. This is where you get the most absorbance. Then as you come down over here, you get a small little peak around 270-ish that is n to pi star. So in order for you to get UV spectral data, the molecule must have pi electrons. So UV absorbance is often used in the Beer-Lambert law. We've seen this on the MCAT numerous times. People may have done this in the laboratories where you actually measure the concentration of proteins through a spectroscopy. And so what you do is you put your molecules or your, your in a solution in a cuvette here and you shine light on it. Here's the the, uh, the initial light, I0, and then as you shine through some of the chromophores, some of the pi electrons are going to be excited and they're going to actually absorb some of that light, and then any light that comes out will be called I. And so since IO is always greater than I, the absorbance, which is the log of IO over I, will always be positive. Okay, and so the Beer-Lambert law basically says that the absorbance is equal to the molar extinction coefficient, which is a unique property to every single chromophore or molecule that's absorbing this UV light. A chromophore is the actual molecular group that's responsible for the absorbance of the light. So A equals the molar extinction coefficient times the concentration in the cuvette 
times the, the length at which the path length, which is normally considered to be one centimeter. And so what you can do is use the beer lambert law to monitor the reaction of enzymes. So for example, here we have pyruvate being converted into lactate. And so pyruvate to lactate is a reduction and concomitantly NADH is oxidized to NAD+. Since NADH has a lambda max at 340 nanometers, what you can do is take your reaction, put it into the cuvette and the spectroscopy will tell you how much reaction is occurring as a function of decreasing the absorbance at 340. So you can use UV spectroscopy not only to measure how much protein you have in a solution, but also to monitor the progress of reactions. So nucleic acids, of course, can be uh, studied by UV spectroscopy, and people commonly measure solutions of RNA and DNA with this. But DNA is interesting because it, the, the actual absorbance is a function of whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded DNA. So if you denature DNA, what happens is that you get an increase in absorbance after denaturation. That's because in the double-stranded DNA, all those base stacking interactions interfere with the absorption. So when you're single stranded, all those chromophores, all those pi electrons in those pyrimidines and purines are now able to absorb more of the UV. And as a consequence, what you get is what's known as a hyperchromic shift upon denaturation. And if you're going to anneal, you get a hypochromic shift. So we turn over to nuclear magnetic resonance and most people will consider it being protons. Yes, carbon 13 also does it, but I think the MCAT's gonna heavily focus on nuclear magnetic resonance. And so we call it protons or hydrogens. We use this term interchangeably when we refer to nuclear magnetic resonance. And so in order to perform NMR, you need an odd number of protons and or an odd number of neutrons. They have to have a non-zero value for their spin quantum numbers. So we have to think about the spin quantum number. And we know that basically that nuclei can actually spin. They have it. And in a, if there's no magnetic field applied, basically no magnet, they, they orient themselves randomly. So all these nuclei are orient themselves randomly. But if you actually put a magnet to it, that what happens is that you can get an alpha and a beta. So separated by energy levels. And so some will spin up and some will spin spin down and the small differential in energy is utilized to actually generate NMR structures. So there's four essentials for the MCAT on NMR. I mentioned that protons and hydrogens are used interchangeably. There's what's known as the chemical equivalency of protons. And so the molecular environment by which the proton resides in is fundamental to its NMR uh, spectra. The chemical shift refers to shielding of nu the nucleus by electron density. So if, for example, you have an electron withdrawing group next to a hydrogen, what will happen is that since the electron withdrawing group is gonna suck electrons towards itself, it's gonna expose the nucleus to the magnetic field. And what you'll get is a chemical shift. And we'll take a look at that in a moment. There's also splitting. This is called the N plus one rule and it refers to the number of neighboring hydrogens. So the number of neighboring hydrogens will affect the actual spectra. And then lastly is integration. This is proportional to the number of protons that give rise to the peak. So let's take an example here. So the first one we see is benzene, C6H6. Pretty simple here. What you see is that each of the six protons is in an equivalent molecular environment, so there's only one peak right here, okay? But if we look at something like chlorocyclobutane, what we see is that there's four carbons and each carbon has at least one proton hydrogen attached to it. So what we see then is potentially we can have four peaks, but we only see three peaks. And the reason why is because peak two, or actually proton two and proton three, these are in chemically equivalent environments due to the symmetry as you go out from the chlorine, you go this one here and this one there, they're the same. And so when you look at the structure, what we get is an NMR spec spectra that has three peaks. So what we see here is, let's take a look at number one over here. So number one, carbon one is peak C. 
this is actually the most the most de-shielded. It's considered to be downfilled. And the fact that it's de-shielded means this chlorine is sucking away electrons from the hydrogen. And as a consequence, it's exposing its nucleus to the actual magnet. And so it resonates at a higher frequency. And that looks as if it's down, it's more de-shielded is what they say. It's more downfilled. And so if you look at this, it's going to be a multiplet because it's going to be, there's actually five in here. You probably can't see it with good resolution. The reason why is because it has two neighbors here, two neighbors there, and the N plus one rule would be four plus one or five. If you take a look at B here, this is actually a consequence of peaks uh, two and three here. These are in identical molecular environments. And so what you see is it has a higher reading to it. The, it's the integration phenomenon. And over here, uh, A, which is basically carbon four, is going to give us an, a, a multiplet because there's four neighboring carbons. N plus one is five. It's the most upfilled one. You should check out some of the stuff we have in our physical sciences section test. We have some really good structures to practice that you can practice with. So what you should also remember is the relative chemical shift values. So we said that, of course, that there's more de-shielding when you have electron density pulling. And this might be the reason why carboxylic acids are so highly de-shielded. So because that proton is got the carbox, the C double, the C OO that's pulling away from it. So carboxylic acids are really downfield shifted. You should definitely memorize the trends and the, uh, the relative values would be helpful too for the MCAT. So we take a look at fluorescence, and what fluorescence is, is basically when a molecule or an atom is, absorbs either uh, energy or a photon, and what happens is that it excites from a ground state of S0 into something S1. It's a higher energy. And what can happen is that you can get vibrational relaxation. So these are all different vibrational energy levels of S1, and what it'll relax, and then at some point it's going to basically fall down in energy, it's going to emit light at a higher wavelength because that's going to be lower energy. And as a consequence, what can happen then is you can ultimately emit a photon and you can actually detect these fluorescent events. So what we see is absorption, vibration, and then we actually emit light, which is known as fluorescence. And what can happen is a phenomenon known as fluorescence re resonance energy transfer or FRET. Here's a typical fret Jablonski plot, it's called. So we have our electromagnetic radiation coming in, exciting uh, so a molecule, and then it go up in energy level here. And then what happens is that if there's, there's going to be an acceptor with an overlapping wavelength, and what, can, what happens is that you actually can jump over from the donor to the acceptor if they have overlapping wavelengths and you can have the acceptor emit the light. So you can shine light on the donor and have the acceptor actually emit the light. And so what this is used for in biochemistry is when two things are closely juxtaposed together, you can have a donor on one and acceptor on the other. And so if two things come together biologically, you may be able to detect they're coming together by observing threat activity. So with that in mind, Let's get all ready for some workshop passages. We got a couple of really good ones today. And so everyone start to log in.